Hello, everybody, and welcome to our Public Speaking 101 Awards and Showcase. Um, we're so excited that you could be with us today. I'm joined by my co-instructor, Selma, and uh, we've had an incredible week. Um, it's amazing that we've been doing this since the very early days of summer, and I think this is week eight for us, right? Selma, <laughs> this is our eighth week of instruction, and I have to tell you, this is our best group yet. Uh, I don't know if we're getting better or if our students are getting better, but some magic really happened this week. The fact that four days ago, we gave them a topic that none of them knew anything about, and we learned about the government, we learned about social media, we learned about other countries, we learned so much information this week, and I think you're gonna see all of that come out in their persuasive speeches today. So we're really excited that you're able to join us. I'm PJ, by the way, um, and uh, you heard me say Selma as my co-instructor. I really do think that we're kind of cohorts in crime. We've been working together for a while now, and we really do feed off of each other, and we have different strengths and weaknesses, and we feed off those strengths and weaknesses. And we're Hi. joined also by Mr. Brad. Hi, Mr. Brad. Hi. I, this is your show. I don't want to interrupt, <laughs> but I want to do uh, ditto that, that uh, PJ and Selma, you have done an amazing job this summer, and I know you're, all your kids and your graduates can attest, uh, and uh, you've worked hard, and, and I can tell from all the success of your students. I want to thank you, and I want to wish everyone good, good luck today. Thank Thanks. you. Thanks for a great job. See Thanks everyone. for being here. Um, as a lot of you know who are watching, uh, this is recorded so that if any of your family members missed it, um, you will be getting an email that has a recording attached to it. So you'll be able to see the speeches over and over again, um, and you can show them to other people as well. Um, I think you should be very proud. I think all the students should be very proud of what they've accomplished and achieved this week. Some are we ready for awards already? Oh my gosh, do you want to talk about the class? You already talked about them. Just like you said, everyone did such an amazing job. As you can tell, we had fun both inside the classroom and when we were playing all different types of activities as well. So hopefully they can give you some of the activities and you guys can play it during family game night or something too. So without further ado, PJ's going to start, start the our awards. Woo! Of course, there's like some kind of like not upbeat song. Our first certificate goes to Giselle Chan. Our next certificate goes to Aditya Jagannathan. Our next certificate goes to Sophia Johnston. Our next award goes to Eileen Nee. Our next award goes to John V. Shaw. Ihina Skolka. Chokla, Chokla, sorry, Ihina. Uh, Angela Yang. And Joshua Yang. Congratulations to everybody. You did a great job this week. Um, as Mr. Bratt was here and talked about our students, and I talked about our students finding their voice, uh, this morning they were able to fill out their student survey. So those parents who are watching right now and parents who watch this on the replay on the tape, the recording, uh, you'll be able to actually do a parent survey as well. So you just type in parentsurvey.capitaldebate.com and there are a few questions there. 
I will tell you that I've worked with a lot of organizations over the years and a lot of people do surveys, but they don't always pay attention to them. And at Capital Debate, they read every single survey that's submitted, both by students and parents. And many times, year upon year, they make changes based on the surveys. So definitely be honest in your opinions, share your ideas, the information that you have, um, because it only helps our company grow and get better. So a couple different programs that Capital has developed. And if you enroll in different programs today, you get 50% off your next camp. And I believe they're gonna have camp for three more weeks. Selma and I have one more week together. And then I think Selma's gonna do two weeks. You're doing two weeks after that? Yeah. Um, so different programs that they have, and some of them will be for the remainder of the summer, some of them might not exist, and you'll have to enroll in them for next year. But Business Communications is a great program, Selma and I both teach that. Uh, legal Communications, Interpersonal Communications, and STEM Communications, which is a course I've taught as well. Then there's different levels of debate. So they've completed Debate 101, and they just received their certificates for that. Then the next step is debate 201, where they actually start debating against another person. So you'll see today the development of the persuasive speech, which is the foundation of their debate speech. And then that's developed into a debate case, and they debate against one other person in the 201 class. In the 301 class, they debate against everyone in the class, so they have to learn all the different ideas that are out there on the debate topic. And then 401 class is an entire week just of debate back and forth against all the different people who are in the class. There's also a club league and our next slide is gonna talk a little bit about the club league and going into the school year. So the 2020-2021 debate league um, has just opened. So Capital Debate um, has always run, but I think it's gonna become more prominent now that we're in an online format and Capital Debate's done such a great job with their online classes. So you're gonna see more and more students joining their um, debate program during the school year. So that's what this slide is about. It talks a little bit the, about the fact that registration is open. They're gonna have a monthly debate tournament. They're also gonna do weekly online practices. And then they're also gonna have workshops and clinics um, for different students across the country. So if you don't have a debate program at your school, this is always a great option for students to be able to continue with speech and debate and continue with that weekly type of education of public speaking and then learning how to debate different topics. Um, so if you're interested in this, you can save $100 um, until August 14th. So you've got a little bit of time to register for that. Um, and again, even if you do have a debate team at your school, that doesn't mean that, that you can't do the Capital Debate League either. So if you've enjoyed the class or you're gonna take future classes or you wanna do something during the school year, this would be a great option for you and uh, to continue with. Now, let's begin our showcase. That's what we came here for, is to really see our students shine. Our first presenter who will invite to the, oh, first, oh, I can't invite her to the screen until I talk about the topic. So our summer debate topic is government regulations on social media companies do more good than harm. We give our 101 students that debate topic and then they have to choose a, a subtopic underneath that big umbrella topic. They develop those arguments in those different areas and put together a persuasive speech. Then if they do the 201 class next week, they actually use that persuasive speech as their opening speech. And then there's two more speeches that they write based on who they're going to debate in their class. Um, we found that going to this format has been really good and it's really helping us shape um, where we're going in the future with debate. So when we had in-person debate um, camps, we would have two weeks. And we would kind of divide it up where the first week we would develop and then the second week we would debate. 
but it wasn't as mindful as what we've been this summer. So having this new um, format of a 101 and then a 201 has really worked out incredibly well. And we've seen our debaters be better at debate because they're starting with the formation and the foundation of persuasion. So that's what you're going to see today. You're going to see basically subtopics of this main topic that everyone across the country in capital debate is debating. So it'll be interesting to see what you think about the different aspects that the students have found when they began to research this topic. Our first person who we're going to invite to the screen is Sophia Johnston. And Sophia's topic or title of her speech is Government Regulations to the Rescue. So, Sophia, if you could join us on screen. Once you're here, I'm going to disappear, but I'll keep my mic on if you need anything, okay? okay. Uh, and, Did you know that 88% yep. of teens have seen someone being mean or cruel to another person on a social media networking site? The number of sexual assault cases on social media has increased by 300%. I affirm that government regulations on social media do more good than harm. First, we need government regulations on social media to continue because the government already has rules in place to keep the public safe. If the government lets inadequate people and unpleasant things on websites or social media, then they are not doing their job to protect us as citizens. An example of beneficial government regulation in the U.S. is the Communications Decency Act of 1934. This act states that Congress has required broadcast media to operate in the public interest. Government regulations that have kept the public safe have also been implemented in China. According to the BBC, on the 12th of February 2020, the Cyberspace Administration of China announced that at the end of January 2019, in the previous six months, it had cleaned up 733 websites and 9,382 mobile apps. Although those are most likely illegal gambling apps or copies of existing apps used for illegal purposes, government regulations are actually helping out not just the media, the public too. When they have the rules set for the public and the media, then they'll feel the public will feel more comfortable using those apps and applications. The government should have laws for our safety, other government citizens to keep them on the right safe part of the internet. According to the BBC in 2020, the EU is considering a clampdown specifically on terror videos. The social media platforms face fine lines they do not delete the extremes content within an hour. Therefore, they will delete the bad content in the time allotted. According to the ADL, terrorism is usually defined as the use of violence against non-combats in order to achieve a political goal by inspiring fear in the population. Terrorists hope they can force the government to do what they want. If terrorists are making others fear them on social media, then they will have an advantage against us as a society. So, if they remove them from social media, then they will not have that fear factor advantage. According to The Verge in 2019, critics say that the uploaded filter could be used by governments to censor their citizens, and that aggressively removing the extremist content could prevent non-governmental organizations from being able to document events in the war-torn parts of the world. We have laws and regulations in place, but like the EU, we need to put down more strict laws for things like terror videos and sexual content. We need these because if we expose two kids too early, that could be dangerous. Our teens and our society can only be protected by the strict government regulations. Will you stand for government regulations? Thanks so much, Rofia, for your speech. We now invite your classmates to join us on camera. So please open your cameras and unmute your mics for one minute of questions. Angela, you're first. How can you guarantee that the government will regulate all websites and posts? I can not guarantee, but I know for sure that the government will have a filter that will help filter out all the bad content so then you only are left with good content. Thank you. You're welcome. What can the government do to prevent children from seeing inappropriate content? 
Um, like I told Angela, I think that they could have a filter to filter out all the bad, like negative and positive, like things on social media. And so then you're left with the good. Thank you. You're welcome. Do you think that if what the government imposed these regulations, they would be too restrictive and controlling? Um, if the government has those regulations, they might be more strict than the public may want, but they're doing it for our safety. And if they go too far, then I bet that the public will speak up. All right, thank you. You're welcome. What if the government were to abuse its power? If the government were to abuse its power, uh, I'm not the government, so therefore I do not know exactly what would happen, but I would hope that they would come up with a law to make sure that that does not happen. Thanks so much, Sophia. We're now going to invite our next speaker to the screen. That's Ahina Shukla. And her title is In Government We Trust. So, Ahina, if you could turn your camera on. There you are. You're all set. Make sure your mic is on, too. Um, Whenever you're ready. There are approximately 4 billion people who use social media. However, recent studies have revealed that more than half of those users think that there is a need for more stricter policies created by the government. Those users think their trust has withered as more misinformation and inappropriate posts pop up. Government regulations on social media companies do more good than harm. Society has a difficult time trusting social media. There's a lot of misinformation and fake news about events such as campaigns and coronavirus. People expect to trust social media to inform them of vital information. According to CBS News June 2019, 60% of respondents in a new survey the social media companies were not effective in controlling fake news, deterring hate speech, and protecting privacy. This shows that more than half of social media users don't have faith in these websites. Social media users don't expect appropriate news to be shown because they have lost confidence. According to CNN News, to May 2020, one study found that more than one of the most popular YouTube videos about the novel coronavirus contained misinformation. This shows that misinformation can potentially hurt somebody. Millions of viewers watched those videos and got the wrong idea on a harmful virus. According to BBC News, April 2020, one example had been shared more than 40,000 times from a Facebook user who wrote that he heard firsthand from a doctor who recovered in double quick time from the coronavirus by inhaling steam. This is another instance where misinformation can harm someone's health. Fake facts on social media are dangerous. Government regulations can help with restoring trust and confidence. Their policies will, will, their policies will moderate, limit, and dictate the variety of news on social media. This is important because when someone puts their trust into an article or a post, they will have the wrong idea about the news. Misinformation will break society's trust and can harm someone. Society also has to be very cautious on social, me social media. This happens because there are a lot of inappropriate or dangerous posts on social media websites. According to internetmatters.org, 2020, 56% of 11 to 16 year olds have seen explicit material online. More than half of the minors on social media have experienced inappropriate content on social media already. This entails racist and mature posts. Minors shouldn't have to experience these subjects, especially online. According to CyberSafetyPacifica.org, 2019, viewing inappropriate content may be damaging to a young person's well-being. If age-restricted content can be damaging to well-being, then need for limitation should be mandatory. Mental health shouldn't be injured because of lack of enforcement to eliminate enact posts. According to MorningConsult.com, 2020, 68% of those who voted for Trump four years ago said his administration should tackle social media companies' moderation policies and make it a priority, compared to 45% of all adults. After the president himself posted an inappropriate tweet, concerns started to arise from many adults on social media. Yes, youth face the most threat from mature content, but adults are prone to the danger as well. Society should not have to fear the danger online. 
Regulations are desired from social media users of all ages. Social media users view social media as a threat to their mental health, whereas social media is supposed to be a safe domain. There needs to be stricter regulations. In order to prevent misinformation and block inappropriate posts, we need to have governmental regulations. Therefore, I support that governmentals do more good than harm on social media websites. Thank you. Thanks so much, Ahina. We're now gonna have one minute of questions. Questioners, please open your cameras and unmute your mics and join us in the room for questioning period. Do you think that social media can handle this without the government? No, because there's a there needs to be some law involved at this point because there's too much illegal activity and harmful activity going on. Personally, that's my opinion. Okay, thank you. Uh, other than taking down fake posts, how does the government restore trust and confidence? There's unsafe activities like there could be stalkers and stuff and other dangerous people plus as i said that there's lots of inappropriate content which shouldn't be online anyways thank you. all right thank you how can you be sure that the government will do a better job than the social media companies to remove fake news if social media companies had it under control, it wouldn't be such a big problem at this point. There's so much, there's only so much that a, a small organization can do. At this point, they need more help, in my opinion. Time okay. for one more quick question. Um, what will the government be doing to the social media companies to restrict? Well, first I suggest they review posts before they're posted and they make sure they get the message across of what will happen if people do wrong stuff online. Thanks so much, Ahina. Our next presenter is Aditya Jagannathan, and the title of his speech, A Need for Government Regulations. Aditya, if you could turn your camera on. There you are. We all. Hello? Go ahead. Okay. We all love having access to in instant information through our phones and social media apps, but have you ever thought about harmful effects on social media from unwanted content to harmful content? We need government regulations to tighten our regulations. I affirm that government regulations on social media companies do more good than harm. First, it is imperative that we have government regulations on social media companies because they have powers to, because they can take action much faster than social media companies. The government has powers to arrest, to block and ban users. According to BBC in February, 2020, companies will have to ensure that harmful content is removed quickly and take steps to prevent it appearing in the first place. If the government takes action, they will ensure more harmful content is removed. The people will be very happy about the government taking action on social media content. According to Blog Hootsuite, with many people glued to their screens, the wrong message could change up things really quick. It is especially important for the public sector to get out, get out their message in a clear, calm, and professional manner. If we don't have government regulations, things will go out of hand like suicide. If the government can stop unwelcoming content, which has hurt millions, especially teens with cyberbullying, specifically according to CBS News, second leading cause of death among teenagers in the United States. A recent CDC study has found, te found that teens jumped 56% from 2007 to 2017. 56% is a lot. That is 23 million teens. Teens are 12.9% of the population, the global. So when the government takes action on social media, we all be protected from harmful content. Second, government regulations on terrorist propaganda that occurs online is important because the government must ban unwelcoming insight propaganda. If the rate of websites slow down, the rate of attacks will also slow down because everything is done online. 
According to ADL.org, many terrorist groups have their own websites and they and their supporters have profiles on different social media sites. They use these to share propaganda and become friends with new people. Newcomers might be friends with several different terror supporters online. What this means is our government regulations can help stop terrorist activities. There are examples of According to according to the verge.com on March 2019, the news law the new laws in EU require platforms to take down any terrorism content within an hour of notice being issued. And they have to ensure this is not really uploaded. If they fail either of these duties, government has to find up to 4% of their global annual revenue. For a company like Facebook, which earned close to 17 billion last year in revenue, that could mean as, as much as fines up to $680 million. What this means is our government regulations will be able to take down harmful material. Stopping terrorist propaganda online is important because the rate of attacks will slow down, which will save many lives around the world. According to our world data in 2019, over the past decade, terrorists have killed an average of 21,000 people worldwide each year. The global death toll from terrorism over the past decade ranged from 8,000 in 2010 to a high of 44,000 in 2014. This means 210,000 people have died altogether in the last decade. If this continues, government will have to take serious action. The government needs to take action or will be losing millions over terrorism that grows online. There are just 46,000 ISIS supporters on Twitter, just supporters on Twitter. Imagine har how much harmful material would reach us if we didn't have regulations imposed by the government. We need regulations to protect us. Thank you. Thanks so much, Aditya, for that speech. We'll now invite questioners to the screen. So please open your cameras and unmute your mics. Um, how do you think that governments could best regulate terrorism? Uh, Did you hear the question? No, I could not. Sorry. Oh, Can you please repeat she, it? Yeah. Oh, yeah. How do you think that governments could best regulate terrorism? Um, by blocking or banning the user. If not, the max they can do is arrest. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> If someone kept on making accounts to post inappropriate news, how would the government solve this issue? Um, they can block and ban the user multiple times before they track them down and arrest them. All right, thank you. Can you explain how or why the government would arrest or like ban them if someone had like someone posts something on a website if they have the right to free speech? Um, it could mean free speech to them, but it could mean harmful content to others or inappropriate content to others. Okay, thank Time you. Time for one more quick question. What do you mean by um, harmful content when you say that in your speech? Can you please repeat that? I really can't hear you because my Wi-Fi. Um, what did you mean by harmful content in your speech? The, the, the question, Aditya, was what did you mean when you said harmful content in your speech? Oh, um, inappropriate things or things like scaring others or many other things which can frighten others. Great. Okay, thank you. Thanks so much. Questioning time has elapsed. Sorry, Ahina. Great job, Aditya. We're now going to move on to our next speaker, who is Giselle Chan. And the title of her speech is Government Regulations, Cyberbullying, and Identity Theft, I think. Yes, Cyberbullying and Identity Theft. Whenever you're ready, Giselle. Did you know that 3.6 billion people use social media worldwide? 
We must have government regulations on social media platforms to protect the billions of people and make the social media companies more liable for the content that they allow to be posted. Which is why I affirm that government regulations on social media companies do more good than harm. Having government regulations on social media is helpful because it will protect people from identity theft. According to BBC News in 2016, a small percentage of cases involved fictitious identities, but most fraudsters assumed the identity of a real person after accessing their name, date of birth, address, and bank details. More than 85% of the frauds were carried out online. I would say that's a lot. We need the government to help protect the citizens from having their identity stolen because it is increasing even to this day. According to Consumer Affairs in 2020, Last year, the FTC processed 9,439 email or social media identity theft reports, a 23% increase from 2017. Government regulations on social media will help stop the increase of social media identity theft reports and help slowly reduce it. Consumer Affairs also states, it is relatively easy for cyber criminals to discover a person's name, date of birth, phone number, hometown, and other sensitive information through social media and networking sites. Having government regulations on social media companies will help prevent cyber criminals from receiving other people's personal information. This is important because if the government got involved, less people would have their identity stolen. Identity theft may ruin your credit history and it can even hurt your job prospects. The second reason why we should have government regulation on social media is because it helps protect teenagers who are bullied or harassed online. According to ifs.com on 2017, social media is a great way for young people to stay in touch with their friends. But research clearly shows that children do not feel that they're shielded from upsetting, dangerous, and adult content. Specifically, a large number of children have experienced this form of harassment online. According to a Pew Research Center survey conducted in 2007, 32% of all teenagers who use the internet say that they have been targets of a range of annoying and potentially menacing online activities. This has manifested as receiving threatening messages, having their private emails or even messages forwarded without consent, or having embarrassing pictures posted without permission. Not only are teens being harassed, but teens are also being called offensive names and bullied online. The Pew Research Center survey also claims that nearly half of Americans ages 18 to 29, say that they have been called offensive names online, while more than a third say someone has tried to purposefully embarrass them. Government regulations on social media are actually necessary and help assure people that they are safe from harmful content or messages. Online bullying or harassment causes significant emotional and psychological distress to many people. Therefore, government regulations on social media will help prevent this from happening. We need government regulation on social media companies to help ensure that the material we are receiving is truthful and not harmful. Without government regulations, how can we protect ourselves and others? Thank you. Thanks, Giselle. We'll now have one minute of questions. Questioners, please open your cameras and unmute your mics. We'll start with Ahina, followed by Josh. To regulate identity thefts, wouldn't the government have to go through private messages? Well, the government has the right to go, well, they don't really have a right to go through private messages, but they can like, on social media, they can put a system where others are allowed to block people that are harassing them just to make them safer. Mm -hmm. How can the government stop the bullying in person if two people were in the same school? Well, the government can't really do anything about it if it's in person, because that would just be bullying. But if it was online, then they can make sure that they can block each other. Thank you. If social media platforms cannot regulate identity theft, then how will the government do it? Well, the government can help enforce the law that they're going to make, so it will probably help make the situation better. Okay, thank you. If the government does regulate social media, is it a guarantee that all identity thieves will be banned from social media or will be caught? 
Well, I can't guarantee that all of them will be caught, but I'm sure a lot of them will be because of their security systems. Okay, Time thank for you. One quick question. How will the government regulate bullying? Um, like I said earlier, the government can set a system where others can block each other if they're being harassed. Thank you. Thanks so much, Giselle. Our next speaker is Joshua Yang, and the title of his speech, Government Regulations Detrimental to Us. Josh, if you can join us on screen, there you are, whenever you're ready. Twitter has 330 million monthly active users, Instagram has over 1 billion, and Facebook has 2.5 billion users. With this many people using three of the largest social media companies, we must rely upon them to weed out harmful material, which is why I negate that government regulations on social media companies do more good than harm. Government regulations should not be applied as it is unnecessary to society because many social media companies have already dealt with the exposure of extremist and inappropriate material on their sites. As a result, social media companies have perfected more efficient ways of dealing with this material. According to BBC in 2020, social media companies had previously relied on self-governance. Sites such as YouTube and Facebook have their own rules about what is unacceptable and the way that users are expected to behave towards one another. If social media companies can already prevent the exposure of extremist and inappropriate material, what's the point of having government regulations? This would be a huge waste of important time and money. Specifically, according to BBC in 2020, 8.8 .8 million videos were taken down from YouTube between July and September 2019, with 93% of them automatically removed by machines and two thirds of those clips not receiving a single view. It also removed 3.3 million channels and 517 million comments. Globally, YouTube employs 10,000 people in monitoring and removing content, as well as policy development. This proves that not only do social media companies solve the issue, but also solve it efficiently. This is crucial because social media companies are more familiar with their technology. If, if the government gets involved, this, then this extremist and inappropriate material will either stay online for longer before being removed or not removed at all. What if it wasn't removed? Could you imagine how many lives would be impacted if it wasn't removed? The second reason why government regulations should not be applied is because it is detrimental to society since it erodes human rights such as free speech. Slate reports that both our history and the experience of countries around the world illustrates that when afforded leeway to oversee speech, authorities will use that power to serve their own ends, stifling dissent and silencing those who challenge them. The government is abusing their power to benefit themselves and silence those who oppose them. This means that the government is absolutely and continuously failing, yes, failing to do their job. According to HRW, Anti-Asian incidents had continued in the U.S. since the outbreak of the COVID-19 pandemic, with numerous media reports written about discrimination linked to COVID-19. A coalition of Asian American groups that had created a reporting center called Stop AAPI Hate said it had received almost 1,500 reports of incidents of racism, hate speech, discrimination, and physical attacks against Asians and Asian Americans. The government is not doing their job now. What makes you think they'll do it in the future? They will just make everything worse. And did you know that abuse is happening worldwide as we speak? HRW states, in the UK, Asian people have been punched in the face and taunted, accused of spreading coronavirus. Two women attacked Chinese students in Australia, punching and kicking one and yelling, go back to China. This is undoubtedly wrong. People are being abused, cursed at, called racial slurs and harassed, and the government is doing absolutely nothing to take down the content that proliferates this harmful behavior. What if this horrid behavior happened to your family and friends? Imagine how much money would be wasted due to the unneeded presence of government regulations. We should not have government regulations. We need to let our social media companies filter unwanted material. They can do it best. Thanks so much, Josh, for your speech. We'll now have one minute of questions. Questioners, please open your cameras and unmute your microphones. We'll start with Angela. 
How are you? What? Oh, how are you going to make sure that the social media platforms are going to regulate themselves? So I can't really guarantee it. Just like I can't guarantee, just like someone can't guarantee the government will. But I know that social media companies have their own filters they're using to filter like inappropriate content. Okay, thank you. Why don't you think the government can handle this just because they couldn't handle that? Well, they've already failed in the past, and I believe that like social media companies are already handling the inappropriate content well, so I feel like there's no need for the government to step in, otherwise it would just cost the government unnecessary money and time. Okay, thank you. How do you think that social media platforms can continue to keep working on their companies while doing this? Wait, sorry, what? How do you think that social media platforms can, can, can do this while continuing running their companies? Well, they could continue to do this because over the few years, like they've already been, they've ha they have a reputation of doing this already filtering inappropriate content they have they have like they have their they have a big organization so they have a lot of people who work there who could uh continuously do the same thing every day thank you thanks so much josh our next speaker is john v shaw and her title is our true selves Javi, you got to turn your mic on. <laughs> How do you use social media? You may use it to state your personal opinions or to share your life experiences, or most importantly, to express yourself. Now imagine this freedom being snatched from you. I negate the resolution that government regulation of social media companies does more good than harm. When governments regulate the content posted on social media, it disintegrates an individual's ability, ability to express themselves. This is because social media is where people share their particular viewpoints on issues. If the government holds contrary belief to an individual's opinion, the government will attempt to obliterate this evaluation and limit how social media users read or share their personal opinion. According to Cato Institute in 2019, regulations of social media companies might either indirectly restrict individual speech or directly limit the right to curate an internet platform. The First Amendment offers strong protections against such restrictions. As we all know, the First Amendment ensures our freedom of speech and other things such as religion, but the government regulating social media will restrict this right. According to B. Hill, the government shouldn't require these companies to allow access to everyone because social media companies are private companies, not government actors, and these companies have their own First Amendment right to exclude anyone from their platforms. Similarly, since they are private companies, the tech companies know their software and database best. So the government venturing to control these companies is not really benefiting anyone. According to ORF in 2019, regulation of social media content should be left to the tech companies themselves because they have an obligation. It could be argued that they are monetizing a public resource, that of citizens. Social media companies have an obligation to the public to limit the spread of misinformation, extremism, and hate speech, etc. So the government would be wasting its time by regulating these companies. The government should not regulate social media content because it prevents people from expressing themselves. The government will attempt to eradicate opinions from the community, which, in the long run, is only benefiting the government and not the society. The second reason the government should regulate social media companies is because um, it would reduce people's rights, such as freedom of religion. This is because governments in the past and present have endeavored to quell political conflict, knowledge about protests, religious minorities, and the ability for LGBTQ plus community members to express their identities. If we look at the Chinese government, we see this abuse of people's rights to the Uyghur Muslims. According to the Council on Foreign Relations, even before concentration camps became a major part of the Chinese government, anti-extremism campaign, the government was accused of cracking down on religious freedom and basic human rights in Xinjiang. 
To this end, the Chinese government is suppressing Uyghur Muslims by eliminating all TikToks that talk about the concentration camps being produced for this minor religion. According to FAST, in 2019, government action regulating internet content would constitute state action that may implicate the First Amendment. In particular, social media providers may argue that government regulations impersonally infringe on the own provider's mm -hmm. own constitutional free speech rights. So the government trying to restrain people from posting content goes directly against the First Amendment. We must leave it up to the social media companies to regulate themselves. According to BBC in 2020, sites such as YouTube and Facebook have their own rules about what is unacceptable and the way that users are expected to behave towards one another. Social media companies are already doing their job and have more productive methods to deal with objectionable content. Allowing the government to regulate social media would be detrimental because it would suppress the ability of people to discuss progression within communities and to express themselves. If the government could control this too, they would just try and cover it for political power. I negate the resolution that government regulation of social media companies does more good than harm. It prevents an individual from being their authentic selves and, and being able to learn about what is occurring in today's world. After all, do we really want people to be ashamed of expressing themselves? Thanks, John V. We'll now have one minute of questions. Questioners, please yeah. open your cameras and unmute your mics. We'll start with Ahina. How do you propose that social media uh, helps take away uh, racist posts on their own without government's help? Can you rephrase that? Yeah. How would you? Uh, imagine social media does up to can regulate and moderate it on on it on its own like the posts and articles social media has harsh policies already in place so the government just adding on to that is just wasting their time because they already have their priorities straight thank you what if someone who's like racist and then he or she posts something that's like expressing themselves in a negative way, should would social media take that down? Yes, yeah, social media companies would take that down because it goes against their policies. Okay, thank you. How do you know that social media will fix themselves if they haven't already? Since they already have, like I said to Ahina, they already have pretty harsh policies. So they're they're gonna just start working harder on implying these policies. Thank you. Why is the government taking down certain TikTok videos? Um, so basically there is a minor religion called the Uyghur Muslims and they are being put into concentration camps. So what? So since TikTok is run by China's government, China's government is trying to hide the fact that they're trying to suppress or hide the Uyghur Muslims. They're trying to make that go away by deleting all TikToks that talk about the Uyghur Muslims. Hey, Thank thanks, John V. Our next speaker is Aileen Ni. Nee. And her title of her speech is Government Regulations, a Global Requirement. Protection, a person or thing that prevents something or someone from harm or injury. Protection is exactly what we need against all the negative influences on social media. The real dilemma, however, is who can really provide this to us when so many others have failed? The best answer is the government, because they have the necessary powers to do so. Therefore, I completely agree that having the government regulate social media does more good than harm. To protect citizens from exposure to inappropriate, violent, and harmful content, it is absolutely necessary for the government to regulate social media. This is because social media companies are incapable of removing this negative content. They therefore need the government to do this job instead. 
violent and harmful content ends up being posted anyways because of the publicity it causes. According to Forbes in 2020, there's an adage in the media world, if it bleeds, it leads. This refers to the fact that sensationalist, violent, or other scandalous content provokes more emotions and simply sells more newspapers or advertising. Hence, there's an acknowledged tendency for social media to show emotionally explosive content that leads users to share content within their networks in exchange for likes. Social media companies aren't doing their job to remove harmful content like fake cures for the novel coronavirus. The fake cures are still viewed as harmful because we don't know what problems they can cause since they aren't tested. According to BBC News, Facebook claims, we are taking aggressive steps to remove harmful misinformation from our platforms and have removed hundreds of thousands of these posts, including claims about false cures. Despite these claims, evidence proves otherwise. BBC News also states, Hundreds of posts spreading misinformation about COVID-19 are being left online. Some 649 posts were reported to Facebook and Twitter, including false cures, anti-vaccination propaganda, and more. 90% of these posts remained visible online afterwards without any warnings attached. As you can see, Social media companies evidently can't protect us from violent, offensive, and harmful content like they're supposed to. It is also essential for the government to regulate social media because young and innocent teens are exposed to online harassment every day, which severely affects their mental health. Well, exactly what types of harassment are we talking about? To answer that question, According to Pew Research Center, some 42% of teens say that they have been called offensive names. 32% of teens say someone has spread false rumors about them on the internet, while smaller shares have been the target of physical threats online. As a result of cyberbullying, teens are finally requesting politicians to address this issue because teens know that they are the only ones who can put a stop to it. Pew Research Center also says 59% of U.S. teens have been bullied or harassed online, and teens mostly think teachers, social media companies, and politicians are failing at addressing this issue. Evidently, online harassment is extremely detrimental for teens because it can severely impact their mental health negatively. According to Live Science, there were consistent associations between exposure to cyberbullying and an increased likelihood of depression. I strongly agree that having the government regulate social media does more good than harm. To stop harmful content from being viewed and innocent lives from being cyberbullied, we desperately need the government to regulate social media. Protection is not just a word or a definition. It's something that we all need. Thank you. Thanks so much, Aileen. We'll now have one minute of questions. Questioners, please open your cameras and unmute your microphones. We'll start, whoa, <laughs> we had somebody jump in. Questioners, please open your cameras and unmute your microphones. We'll start with Angela. The government also tells regular people misinformation. So how do you know that they will take down misinformation that they're like not biased against or not biased towards? I am not the government, so I don't have an exact answer for that. However, if the government does post biased information, we as citizens have the right to peacefully protest about it. Thank you. No problem. How do you think the government could filter black bad content? 
I am not the government again, but I'm sure that the government will have its own powers to filter, like social media companies have their own filters. And since the government is more powerful than social media companies, the government can arrest, ban, or block certain users from social media. Thank you. No problem. The DTA, uh, your mic's muted. Yeah, you're on mute. Do you think that social media can do this without the government's help? As I said earlier in my speech, social media companies like Facebook have tried to filter them out. But as you can see, like I quoted in my speech earlier, there's about 649 posts of fake cures after social media, um, I mean, after Facebook tried to go through and filter. And I think that the government would be more effective because they have more power and more capability to filter this negative information out. Time for one more quick question. No problem. Uh, what if the government were to abuse its power? Because what, like, the government won't make laws against themselves. Like I said, if the government does abuse their powers, as citizens, we have the right to peacefully protest about it. Hey, thanks so much, Aileen. Our next speech is by Angela Yang, and her title is The Abuses of Government Power. Angela, if you could join us on camera. There you are, and whenever you're ready. We have so many sources of news and information today, but have you ever wondered if what you are hearing or seeing is true? Much of what we receive has been altered or filtered. Now, imagine if the government could filter everything that we can see. This will only lead to abuse and manipulation, but now on a larger scale. In order to get the truth, I negate that government regulations on social media companies do more good than harm. First, the government should not regulate social media because they abuse their power and force their political views on their citizens. Currently, the US president and his associates accuse social media of being biased against conservatives. According to the New York Times, Mr. Trump and his allies have often accused Twitter and Facebook of bias against conservative voices. He had resisted to act on his opinion until Twitter fact-checked his own false statements in two posts. Because of this, Trump took this a step further and actually signed a law into effect that is solely based on his opinion. The Wall Street Journal records that President Trump signed an executive order seeking to limit the broad legal protection that federal law currently provides to social media and other online platforms. If you really want social media to be regulated, is this the government you want to do so? We have seen this occur worldwide as well. The Chinese government published thousands of articles about their economic development uh, to hide the concentration camps for the Uyghur Muslims. Human Rights Watch reports that the CCP constructed an internet censorship system to monitor and suppress public criticism. Abroad, it uses its growing economic clout to silence critics and built a great firewall to prevent citizens from being exposed to any criticism from the of the government from abroad. This is terrible because the government will regulate social media using their opinions, not, government, not information and facts. False information will spread like wildfire. We will be getting fake news instead of the information we need to stay informed about current events. The second reason why the government should not regulate social media is because the government can use regulation to silence anyone who is in a minority group or disagrees with their political beliefs. In China, the government censors have been taking down any websites related to the Hong Kong protests and are using censorship to hide information. The Los Angeles Times reports Chinese authorities had ordered media to delete any videos related to the Hong Kong protests. One mainland activist stayed awake all night after the two largest mass protest marches, trying to stay ahead of the censors by sharing videos and photos in mainland social media chat groups, only to see them disappear almost immediately. Additionally, when Dr. Li Wenliang, the doctor who discovered COVID-19, passed away, the CCP silenced anyone who spoke out against them on social media. 
CNBC, CNBC states that the doctor's death triggered a wave of grief and anger amongst Chinese social media users, many of whom who were already frustrated with the government's handling of the coronavirus. Some who were more critical of the environment included the hashtag I want freedom of speech in their posts, but that hashtag was quickly censored on Weibo, a social media platform. In Hungary, the government detained a member of the opposing party because he posted on Facebook about what they were planning. According to Euronews, a member of the Momentum Opposition Party was detained in southern Hungary over a social media post about a controversial government policy. He was detained for four hours because he had allegedly obstructed efforts to combat the pandemic. If the government regulates social media and only lets people post about being in agreement with the government's political views, people will not have control over what they are allowed to say or post. This is unacceptable. The government is not letting people use their right to free speech and voice their opinions. I oppose that government regulations on social media companies do more good than harm. We cannot allow the government, who already has a political bias, to control what we see and hear. Seek the truth and support freedom of speech on social media. Thank you. Thank you, Angela. We'll now have one minute of questions. Questioners, please open your cameras and unmute your microphones. So when you ahead, say Jambi. the government will miss if when you say the government will misuse their power. What if social media companies do the same thing? They misuse their power. The social media companies currently have their own like government policies. So that means that they will not be abusing their power. Thank you. Do you think it's worth risking the protection of negative influences on social media for the younger generations? So the first amendment uh, protects freedom of speech, but it does not protect like the inappropriate targeting towards vulnerable audiences. So in that case, the government will regulate that inappropriate stuff, but that's not, that's not risking the freedom of speech. Okay. Thank you. Great. Thanks so much, Angela. We'd not, now like to have everybody join us on camera. We're missing some people. <laughs> okay, well, thank you all for a great showcase. Selma and I had a great week with all of you, and we just wanted to bring you on camera for one last celebration of our week to dance to squeeze chickens to hold our pets in our hands all that kind of stuff so here we go i forgot my dog <laughs> yay chickens <laughs> uh oh the dogs don't like it <laughs> Okay, everybody. Bye. Bye. Bye, everyone. Have a great week. Bye, everybody. Bye. Bye. Have a good summer. Bye. 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 Bye.